Hello everyone. Welcome back to the channel. In our previous lessons, we have already learned about two very important components, the resistor and the capacitor. These two components are essential and we can easily find them in almost every electronic device, as well as inside the ECU of a car. And in today's lesson, we are going to continue with the third type of component. That is the coil, also known as the inductor and the transformer. These components also play a very important role, not only in general electronics, but especially in automotive electrical and ECU systems. For example, in a car, the ignition coil is actually a type of transformer, and inductors can be found in many circuits inside the ECU with different applications and purposes. So, how is an inductor built, and how does a transformer work? Let's find out together. First, Let's talk about the structure of an inductor. An inductor is made by winding a piece of copper wire into many turns. This copper wire is covered with an insulating layer called enamel coating. The core of the coil can be made from different materials, such as air core, ferrite core, adjustable core, or laminated iron core. On circuit diagrams, we also see different symbols for inductors. L1, air core inductor. L2, ferrite core inductor. L3, adjustable core inductor. L4, laminated iron core inductor. Now, let's learn about the characteristic quantities of an inductor. The first one is the self-inductance coefficient, according to Faraday's law. Self-inductance is the quantity that represents the induced electromotive force in the coil when there is a changing current flowing through it. To understand it more simply, when the current in the coil changes, the magnetic flux generated inside the coil also changes. This change in magnetic flux induces back an electromotive force called the self-induced EMF. And this induced EMF always acts to oppose the change of the original current. The strength of this phenomenon is measured by the self-inductance coefficient. The formula for calculating self-inductance is L equals open bracket and R multiplied by 4 multiplied by 3.14 multiplied by N squared multiplied by S multiplied by 10 to the power of minus 7, close bracket, divided by L, where L is the self-inductance of the coil measured in Henry, symbol H. N is the number of turns of the coil. L is the length of the coil measured in meters. S is the cross-sectional area of the core measured in square meters. And mer is the relative permeability of the core material. The second characteristic quantity is the inductive reactance. Inductive reactance of a coil is the quantity that shows how the coil opposes the current when an alternating current flows through it. Important note, with direct current or DC, the coil only has its natural resistance. It has no inductive reactance. With alternating current or AC when the current is continuously changing, the coil generates a self-induced electromotive force that opposes this change. This opposition is called inductive reactance. The formula for inductive reactance is Z sub L equals 2 multiplied by pi multiplied by F multiplied by L, where my pi is approximately 3.14. Z sub L is the inductive reactance measured in ohms. Minus F is the frequency of the alternating current measured in hertz. L is the inductance of the coil measured in Henry, the meaning of each part. The term 2 times pi relates to the oscillating nature of alternating current. F the frequency shows how fast or how slow the alternating current changes. L, the inductance, shows the ability of the coil to resist the change in current. Now let's see what happens when we change the values. If frequency F increases or if inductance L increases, then inductive reactance Z sub L also increases. If frequency F equals zero, which means direct current, then Z sub L equals zero. That means the coil has no inductive reactance with DC. Let's look at a specific example. Suppose the coil has an inductance L of 0.2 Henry, and the alternating current has a frequency F of 50 Hertz. We calculate Z sub L equals 2 multiplied by 3.14, multiplied by 50, multiplied by 0.2 equals 62.8 ohms. So at a frequency of 50 Hertz, the inductive reactance of the coil is 62.8 ohms. Now let's do an experiment to illustrate inductive reactance. In this experiment, 
A coil is connected in series with a light bulb and then connected to a 12 volt power supply. This power supply has different frequencies and is controlled through the switches K1, K2, and K3. When K1 is closed, a direct current flows through the coil. At this moment, the inductive reactance Z sub L equals zero. Therefore, the current through the coil is the strongest and the bulb glows the brightest. When K2 is closed, an alternating current of 50 Hertz flows through the coil. Since the inductive reactance Z sub L increases, the current becomes weaker and the bulb glows dimmer. When K3 is closed, an alternating current of 200 Hertz flows through the coil. At this higher frequency, the inductive reactance Z sub L is the highest, the current through the coil is the weakest, and the bulb glows the dimmest. Conclusion the inductive reactance of a coil is proportional to the inductance of the coil and proportional to the frequency of the alternating current. This means the higher the frequency of the alternating current, the harder it is for the current to pass through the coil. And with direct current, the frequency F equals zero hertz. Therefore, the inductive reactance Z sub L equals zero, and the current passes through the coil easily. Now, let's learn about the resistance of a coil. The pure resistance is simply the resistance of the wire that is used to wind the coil. When we use a multimeter set to the ohm range, the value we measure is this pure resistance. For a coil of good quality, the resistance is usually much smaller than the inductive reactance. This means the coil mainly opposes alternating current because of inductive reactance and it does not waste much energy on its resistance. In addition, this resistance is also called the loss resistance. Why is that? Because when current flows through the coil, this resistance consumes electrical energy and converts it into heat. This is the reason why the coil becomes hot during operation. In short, resistance is the opposition to current caused by the material of the wire itself. Inductive reactance is the opposition to current caused by the phenomenon of electromagnetic induction. Now, let's learn about the charging and discharging property of an inductor. First, the charging process, when current flows through the coil. When a current flows through the coil, a magnetic field is formed around it. The energy stored in the inductor is exactly the energy of this magnetic field. The formula for the stored energy is W equals L multiplied by I squared divided by two, where W is the stored energy measured in joules, L is the inductance measured in Henry. I is the current. The meaning is, the larger the current, the more energy the coil stores in its magnetic field. Second, the discharging process, when the current decreases. When the current flowing through the coil decreases, the magnetic field also decreases. At this moment, the coil releases or discharges the energy that was stored in its magnetic field. This released energy is given back to the circuit in the form of a self-induced electromotive force. And according to Lenz's law, this induced EMF always opposes the decrease of the current. Therefore, an inductor has the property of resisting sudden changes of current. When the current increases rapidly, the coil absorbs part of the energy, which makes the rise slower. When the current decreases rapidly, the coil returns its stored energy, which makes the fall slower. In summary, charging stores energy in the form of a magnetic field. Discharging releases magnetic energy to maintain the current. Let's observe a small experiment to demonstrate the charging and discharging property of an inductor. In this experiment, when switch K1 is closed, current begins to flow through the coil. Because the coil creates inductive reactance, it resists any sudden increase of current. Therefore, the current does not rise instantly, but increases gradually. As a result, the light bulb lights up slowly. Next, when K1 is opened and K2 is closed, the energy that was stored inside the coil is immediately released. This energy creates a reverse induced voltage, which passes through the bulb, making the light bulb flash for a moment. This is the phenomenon of the inductor discharging. Applications of the inductor. In practice, we can see that inductors are used very widely. For example, in loudspeakers, the inductor helps create electromagnetic vibrations converting electrical signals into sound. 
In relays, the coil generates a magnetic field which pulls and releases the contacts to control other electrical circuits. In addition, inductors are also used in frequency filter circuits, helping to remove noise or adjust the input voltage. As we can see, the inductor is an important component, and it appears very often in real life, as well as in electronic engineering. And finally, let's talk about the transformer. In daily life, a transformer is a very common device. Its main function is to change alternating voltage. For example, step down, lowering a high voltage down to any lower voltage, or step up, raising a low voltage up to a high voltage, which we often call high voltage. The basic structure of a transformer includes a primary coil, where we apply the input voltage, one or several secondary coils, where we take the output voltage for use. All of these coils are wound on a magnetic core, which can be laminated steel or ferrite. In the automotive field, transformers are often used in circuits that require high voltage, for example, in the fuel injector control circuit or in the solenoid valve control circuit. Uh, the most practical and familiar application is the ignition coil. In fact, the ignition coil is also a transformer. Its job is to raise a low voltage into a very high voltage, in order to trigger the spark plug ignition. So we have just learned about the coil and the transformer, along with some of their real-world applications. If you would like me to explain more details, feel free to leave a comment below. In the next part of our series on electronic components, uh, we will discover something truly important, the very foundation of modern electronics. That is the semiconductor. So, don't forget to subscribe and follow the channel so you won't miss my upcoming videos. Goodbye and see you again in the next lesson.